Exam prep's coming along? OK. So I've got uh, two announcements. Well, actually, maybe three. So we'll, we'll get everything in order here. So first, I do have a review session scheduled. It will be in ALS 4001 on Saturday at 3 PM. And I will videotape that. And we're set there. And um, that was number one. I said three, didn't I? Uh, number two, um, I've had several people comment about the extra credit question that I have thrown out at you. And yes, uh, it will be on the exam. Um, and there is a sort of a solution to it in the book, but I'm looking for more than what that book says. Okay. So the book talks about how the, the change in structure you know, that can occur is similar for allosterism as well as what's happening in cooperativity. But there's actually a little bit more to it than that. And it's a little bit more that I'm looking for. Okay? So there's something else that's similar that is important uh, for that uh, phenomenon that I described to you. Okay? Um, so think about that. And the last thing is the logistics of, this, uh, of getting it set up are such that there are 250 of you. We aim as best we can to get the exam in your hands as quickly as possible. And to do that, we need your cooperation. So I'm going to tell you how I want you to sit when you come into the room. Okay? So um, starting with this aisle right here, you are number one on this, this far edge. Okay? I want everybody sitting at least two away from everybody else. In fact, I want everybody sitting in the odd numbered one. So one, three, one, three, OK? For this one over here, it starts one, three, five, seven, nine, et cetera. I'm sorry? This is 11. Well, I'm just saying, count from the end is all you, have, all you have to do. Just count from the end and count in an odd number, OK? And from that is the end I want you to count in from. All right? Same thing here, OK? So start one, three, five, et cetera, OK? Everybody got that? So if you come in and you do that, and I don't have to get you up and moving you around and so forth, we can get the exam out quicker. All right? The same things hold up there. So one over there, one there, and then one over here. Everybody clear on that? OK, so it's important uh, to do that. I will also tell you that you'll find that I'm very picky about time in the exam. And I do that to give everybody an equal chance. All right? That is, I can't have some people taking two minutes to fill out their exam while they're waiting in line to come up and turn their exam in after I've called time off. So when I call time off, I will expect everybody will immediately stop writing. All right? If I see anybody writing after I say stop, then I will take points off. All right? And I'll warn you about that during the exam. But it's important that you stop when I say stop, because I don't want anybody having a time advantage over others. The first exam, there, there are sometimes time issues. Okay? So don't spend too much time on any one question. I've tried to make it shorter so that you won't have the issues with time. Okay? But nonetheless, problem solving sometimes takes some people longer than others. So don't spend too much time on any one question. Okay? And again, I want time to be equalized for everybody as much as I can. And that's why I do it. I don't do it to be mean, much as you might think I do. Okay? Um, and let's see. What else can I say? Um, be sure, obviously, one of the, be the biggest recommendations I have is put your name on your exam as soon as you get it. Okay? What, this happens every year. I get somebody, and they've got to write their name on their exam after I said it's time to stop. I say, it's just my name. Well, I can't tell if you're writing your name or you're writing answers. So if I see you writing, even if it's your name, after time has expired, you're going to lose points. So get your name on there. Don't wait to do that. Yes? Question? Uh, so can you use pen? You can use pen. You can use pencil. You can use crayon as far as I'm concerned. Okay. As long as, 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 as yes, you're welcome to use crayon. We may get a good laugh out of it as we're grading it, but, but uh, it, uh, as long as we can read it. The biggest issue that we have is reading what you've written. If we can't read your name and we have to figure out what your name is, you'll lose some points. And I tell everybody every time, print your name clearly. And I still see these scrawls people put on there for their name. I'm thinking... You know, you want a zero? You don't want a zero, right? Make sure we can read your name. Put them in big block letters. I mean, that's, that's just a no-brainer. Okay, 
Um, so that's pretty much the stuff for the exam. And uh, as I say, come in, get seated where I told you to get seated appropriately. If you get down here and there's no seats down here, then the logical thing to do is go up the stairs. Where should I sit? Well, look at that up there, okay? So it's pretty straightforward. All right, so that's the logistics for the exam. And um, hopefully everybody aces it. I'd be delighted if that happened. Absolutely would. Okay. Well, um, I want to um, finish up the stuff on enzymes. I went through that lineweaver burke business uh, with the in inhibition and so forth last time. And so I've only got a couple of things uh, to talk about. And they actually relate to our very next topic anyway. So the, this break point for the exam was a very good break point that um, I made there. So the first of these is a chemical modification that can be done to proteins. Okay? So you've seen a couple of chemical modifications already. You saw cyanogen bromide, for example, could cut um, a polypeptide at methionine residues. That was, a, that was, a, that was a, a covalent bond that was broken. You saw that uh, mercaptoethanol could reduce disulfide bonds between cysteines. And that was a covalent bond that was changed. Well, the next one I want to describe to you is a covalent bond in which something is added to a protein. And this addition of things to proteins uh, can serve some useful purposes. All right? This compound here is called DIPF, and it's got a longer name than I'm going to uh, require you to know, since I can't even recall it off the top of my head uh, as it is. Diisopropyl fluorophosphate. Possible floor, I don't know, who knows. DIPF, right? This is, this, com this is the compound right here. You don't need to know the structure, but the important thing about this compound is it reacts with the side chains of serines in proteins. It reacts with the side chains of serines in proteins. And since the side chains of serines are OHs, this is what we end up making over here. Well, why do we care about this? All right, as we will see, Sometimes serine plays a very important role in catalysis of an enzyme. There's a whole class of enzymes known as serine proteases. And if that serine plays an essential role, that is the OH plays an essential role, and I basically destroy the OH, you can imagine I would have a pretty serious effect on an enzyme that used or that, 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 that had that serine if I, if I destroyed it by adding DIPF. So, one of the ways that I can tell, or one of the easy tests I can do about does this enzyme have any serines that are important for catalysis, is I can take an enzyme and I can treat it with DIPF. And then I can use that enzyme in a reaction and say, does it still work? Is its activity affected? If its activity is affected, then I've got some kind of evidence that serine may in fact be, uh, have some important role in the catalysis or catalytic action of the enzyme. Yes, sir? So your question is, I'm not sure, an inhibitor is something different now. I'm, I'm, I'm actually modifying the enzyme here. So, so um, I think you're asking if DIPF is an inhibitor of some sort. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Okay. So DIPF per se is not a, a, an inhibitor. Okay. Um, it would not, anything that would covalently bind to an enzyme would not fit into either of those categories because remember that, that um, competitive and non-competitive inhibition are both reversible things. They're not covalent bonds. So when we have covalent bonds, we have other things going on, and that actually leads me to my next topic uh, in just a second. But everything I've talked about in terms of inhibition so far are reversible reactions. And as I said, that's important to have reversible because remember the example I gave where I treat a cancer patient with methotrexate? That goes on to the enzyme, it inhibits the enzyme, but if I don't flush that out, I'm gonna kill the patient. And the fact that it's reversible, I can flush it out, allows the patient to live. If I can't flush that out, as I would have with a covalent reaction, then the patient's going to die with the treatment. So I don't want to have that. So these are reversible inhibitions that we do. Okay? At least what I've talked about so far. There's, there's one that's not. But anyway, this, to answer your question, this is not a specific inhibitor. I mean, it, it might end up inhibiting the enzyme, but not uh, by a competitive or non-competitive mechanism. So I'm just using this now as a tool. This will work on many enzymes. Because if the enzyme has a serine that's essential for activity and I cover that hydroxyl group up, the enzyme isn't going to work. Okay. Um, oh, yes, question. Just a question. Uh, even if we know that it reacts to that particular side chain, how do we know that it's the inactivation of the side chain and not the creation of steric hindrance at the active site that deactivates the enzyme? 
Okay, so his question is a little bit more detailed, which is, um, how do I know that it's the uh, inhibition of the serine side chain and not some other secondary effect, like maybe it's blocking access to the active side or the binding side of the substrate and so forth? We don't. So it's only evidence is all it is. It's not proof that we have that. Okay? So when we go studying an enzyme, we, we get many, many pieces of things together before we make a decision in terms of what actually has happened uh, with that. Okay? But good question. Okay. Yes? No, this is the covalent, remember this is the covalent bond. So when I've got covalent bonds, we're essentially talking about irreversible processes. Yeah. Okay, so speaking of covalent bonds, that brings us to our last type of inhibition. The last type of inhibition is known as suicide inhibition. It's kind of a very, very uh, visual image that you get with suicide uh, inhibition. All right? Suicide inhibition occurs First of all, when the substrate makes a covalent bond to the enzyme, right? So in this case, the substrate is this. The difference between suicide inhibition and the DIPF inhibition is that a suicide inhibitor resembles the substrate. It resembles the substrate. And the enzyme binds it as if it's the substrate and only after it is bound this suicide inhibitor, does the covalent bond occur? And the covalent bond links the molecule to the enzyme. Now, suicide inhibitors will be specific for specific enzymes. DIPF will work with any enzyme that's got serines. All right? Suicide inhibitors will be specific for specific enzymes. This inhibitor right here, bromoacetylphosphate, will only inhibit this enzyme. It's not going to affect other enzymes. And the reason, it has a specific shape, and that specific shape fits in the active site of the enzyme, and only that will fit. It's called suicide inhibition because it's not reversible. Once we've made that link here, this enzyme is dead in the water. So people say, well, is suicide inhibition, is it non-competitive or is it competitive? And the answer is, it's neither. Again, because those are reversible processes, we can wash it away, we can get it away, and we can see the phenomena that we see because they're reversible. We can't see it when we've got a covalent um, uh, suicide inhibitor, a suicide inhibitor in general, period. Okay? Everybody with me? Yeah? So what happens to the enzyme after it's no longer useful? What happens to the enzyme after it's no longer useful? So cells have a garbage cleaning uh, mechanism, as it were, as it were, that will take non-functional uh, proteins and break them down. There's a, there's a structure called a proteasome. Uh, we don't talk about it much in this class, but a proteasome is designed to basically recycle your proteins, right? And it will take those proteins, digest them with proteases to recover the amino acids back out of them. So cells are pretty pretty efficient. Yes, sir. Back in the back. What happens to the inhibitor? Is it destroyed when it destroys the enzyme? What happens to the inhibitor? So it's all going to depend on the chemical stability of the inhibitor itself, and I, and I don't have an answer for that. It's going to depend from, from one to another. Yes, sir? So would the net effect just be moles of inhibitor versus moles of enzyme? The net effect, oh, it's, yeah, actually, that's a good question also. So the net effect of this, will it be, if I have excess inhibitor compared to enzyme, that's going to be the maximum effect I'm going to have, and the answer is yes. So it's, it's, just, a, it's just a concentration phenomenon, that's all it is. Now, a really good example of a suicide inhibitor um, is penicillin. Penicillin works by inhibiting an enzyme that bacteria need to make their cell wall. And it's a suicide inhibitor. It binds that enzyme, and bacteria got no chance. Bacteria make more enzyme. As long as you have excess penicillin, which is what he's talking about here, as long as we have excess penicillin, it binds to that too. Bacteria can't make their cell wall. They can't divide. Bacteria will die. So penicillin is, is the prime example of a suicide inhibitor that I think about when I use it to describe um, the uh, material here. And I think, there it is. Okay. Uh, well, unfortunately, yeah, in, in the old book, they had the structure of the, uh, they had the, structure of the um, uh, penicillin where you could see the bond being formed. You, they don't have it here, so you can't see it. 
Penicillin has an odd four-membered ring, four ring that is very reactive, and it binds very much like the natural substrate to the enzyme, but it makes a covalent bond once it, to the enzyme once it is bound. Okay, now, um, that's pretty much what I want to say about uh, suicide inhibitors, and the very last about what I want to say specifically about enzymes in general. I want to turn to mechanisms of catalysis if there are no other questions. Okay, let's do that. So, you saw up close and personal how hemoglobin worked. And we've talked in general about how enzymes work. Now we're going to spend a couple of lectures looking up close and personal at how a couple of enzymes work. All right? This means that we're going to get a little mechanistic. And I'm usually the first to say I'm not overly fond of being mechanistic. But there are some mechanisms that we need to go through in order to understand at least general principles for how enzymes work. And so that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to spend most of the mechanistic um, uh, considerations in today's lecture. Okay, So I'm going to give you most of those today. So bear with me. Um, I will try to give you a very clear overview of what out of the mechanisms I think are, are, are clearly important. Okay, So um, I start by talking about this class of enzymes we've mentioned a few times already, and these are the proteases. Proteases are enzymes that break peptide bonds in other proteins. And there's a class of proteases that um, is, uh, has a very, very similar mechanism from one protease to the other. And this class of protease is called the serine protease. And as its name would suggest, serine proteases have a very important serine residue. And as we shall see, the serine proteases have the serine uh, residue play a role in the catalytic process. It's actually in the active site and doing its thing. What we're talking about in any kind of proteolytic degradation, that is breaking peptide bonds, is we're breaking bonds between uh, amine groups and carboxyl groups uh, making the peptide bond. These are hydrolysis reactions. When I say a hydrolysis reaction, I'm talking about a reaction in which water is added across the bond to break it. So water is being added across the bond to break it. You will notice that adding water across the bond recreates the carboxyl and it recreates the amine. Okay? Those were joined together and we don't have a free carboxyl when we made the peptide bond. But when we break it with, with a protease, we go back to the carboxyl and the amine. That's an alpha carboxyl and an alpha amine. The enzyme that we're going to focus mostly on, at least up front, is called chymotrypsin. And it was one of the enzymes I mentioned earlier in a table. I said you didn't need to know the specificity of it because it actually can work on a variety of different enzymes. So for example, chymotrypsin will cut this polypeptide right here. It will also cut it over here. So it will cut, in this case, adjacent to phenylalanine and adjacent to methionine for our purposes. All, we, if we think about these as being mostly hydrophobic side chains, we'll be in good shape. And I'll show you a, a little bit more detail about that later. Okay? So this guy will cut in both of those places. Did you have a question? Oh, I, I was just uh, I was thinking it can cut on either side, right? It cuts on the carboxyl side wherever it cuts. Okay. So you see the carboxyl side. There's the carboxyl group. It's not cutting here, but it's cutting on this side. Okay. okay? All right. Um, there, oh, I've already done that. All right. And um, we know that chymotrypsin has a serine that plays a very important role in the catalytic process, partly because if we treat chymotrypsin with DIPF, its activity essentially goes away. So this is one piece of evidence that the serine residue is very, very important in the catalytic process of chymotrypsin. There's other things that we know, but this, this was one piece of evidence that that was the case. We can see that same reaction going on that we talked about before. There's that covalent intermediate, and chymotrypsin is knocked out of action as a result of this. Okay? 
Now, I always like to stop at this point and say something about my profession. All right? I'm a biochemist, and I can say with all honesty that biochemists are lazy people. Okay? We're really lazy people. We like to, and most scientists are lazy people. We like to do things the easy way, I think it's human nature, if we can compared to the hard way. If I try to study the breaking of a peptide bond uh, by an enzyme, it's very difficult to do. You say, well, there it is, but I don't have any easy way of determining that peptide bond got broken. Maybe I have to run a gel and see that the fragments, I create fragments or something when I um, uh, treat it with the enzyme, but that takes hours and so forth to do. I want a very simple assay to tell me in seconds, literally, is the enzyme working? Is the enzyme uh, doing its thing? Because if I can do it in seconds, then I can do a lot more analyses very quickly. So what biochemists have come up with in the case of this enzyme is they've created an artificial substrate that chymotrypsin rec recognizes. Okay? So chymotrypsin will actually act right here on this bond. And even though that isn't exactly a peptide bond, it fits in the enzyme's active site well enough that the enzyme will actually break that bond. When it does, it creates these two molecules right here, this guy and this guy. And you notice this guy is written in yellow, and the reason is because this guy makes a yellow color when it's freed from the other guy. So by measuring how much yellow color I get and how fast I get it, I can study the kinetics of chymotrypsin's action. Otherwise, I've got to spend days doing a single data point, and it's, it's really a pain to do. And I don't want to have to do that if I don't want to have to. All right. Yes, Shen? So if you, like, if you did a, a spectrophotometric assay of that, then it could tell you how much it was working? Yes. So her question is, if I did a spectrophotometric assay, which is basically just measuring the amount of yellow uh, color produced, I can measure the, the reaction, and that's exactly what I do. Okay. So it's very simple for me in the lab to measure how much color I produce. I do that. All right, so that's what happens, and that's what people did when they started studying the mechanism of chymotrypsin's action. When they did that, and they looked at very short time scale, look at this, milliseconds, okay, thousands of a second, they discovered something very odd. And the odd thing that they discovered was that this is product, it's absorbance, so in this case, it's basically the concentration of product that's being made. So we're thinking about velocity going up in this, on the y-axis. And we're thinking time going on the x-axis. Okay? And they see this two-phase curve. Right? There's two things that happen here. Right? They see, first of all, that the reaction occurs in what they call a burst phase, meaning that a lot of product is produced very quickly. You see this, this, the steepness of this line. And then it sort of bends over and goes at a more of what we call a steady state, meaning, well, it's going up, but we're just not seeing that rate, kind of like we saw at the start. When scientists saw this for the first time, they recognized that there have to be two things happening in the catalytic action of this enzyme. A slow phase and a very fast phase. The fast phase, of course, coming first. So there's a fast phase to the catalysis and a slow phase. This tells us that the catalytic process has more than one step. To have a fast phase and a slow phase, I have to have at least, at least two steps. We'll see there's actually uh, seven or eight steps. Okay. The fast phase and the slow phase. All right. So that was a very important uh, step in beginning to understand how it is that chymotrypsin does what it does. Now, we know today that chymotrypsin does something, and many enzymes do this, as we shall see, chymotrypsin does something very interesting. I've talked already about how enzymes are flexible, and that flexibility gives rise to an extreme increase in catalytic action. Okay? And that's one way that we can explain that enzymes accomplish the magic that they accomplish. I'm getting ready to show you another. Okay? Enzymes, remember I said when we talked about the Fisher, uh, when we talked about the, um, the Cochlin induced fit model, I said that the substrate transiently changes the enzyme and then it goes back. Well, this is a very important transient change. We see in the catalytic action of chymotrypsin that it becomes covalently attached to part of the substrate during its catalysis. That's transient, it gets released later. 
But that is an important step. And if we look at what's happening here, here's that artificial substrate that we had. I'm sorry, it's actually over here, the artificial substrate. Back up. The, the artificial substrate is right here. The enzyme acts on it, and it spits out this yellow thing very quickly. The enzyme gets trapped in a covalent bond with the rest of the molecule and only more slowly gets released. So now we see fast step, slow step. And while the enzyme is waiting to get rid of this, it's not catalyzing anything. It has to come back over here. So this accounts for the slow part, the regeneration of the enzyme. Yes? So this is a covalent bond yes. forming. So how is that different than a suicidal? How is it different than a suicidal? It's transient. So the enzyme, as part of its action, gets released from that. Okay? So I guess that was a little confusing when I said a covalent bond you don't get released from, right? Yeah, that's okay. right. But those are chemical changes. That is, that there's not a catalytic action that's involved here. As we'll see, this is a, a part of a big catalytic action. So it's, it's only a very transient thing, but it's, but it's a good question. Okay? 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 So this, this is, I guess this is the exception. This, and, and many enzymes that use this as their catalytic action have this exception. That is, they will become transiently covalently linked, but they get released. DIPF, it's not part of a catalytic action, so it can't get released. Yes, sir? The first portion looks like an SN1 nucleophilic attack, but what about the deescalation in the second portion that's slower? Well, let, let, me, let me go through the mechanism. Okay, I'll just talk about the mechanism. So, um, so this, is, this is just a general scheme of the overall reaction. Okay, now, before I show you the mechanism, I've got to tell you a little bit about the active site of chymotrypsin. Chymotrypsin has three amino acids that play very important roles in the catalytic process. Very important roles in the catalytic process. They're called the catalytic triad. They are aspartic acid, histidine, and serine. And the numbers that you see by these are their position in the primary structure. This is amino acid number 102, this is amino acid number 57, and this is amino acid number 195. Okay? Now, the fact that they're all three brought into close proximity to each other, that happens because of folding, right? Folding brings together things that aren't close in primary sequence, and they're brought into very close proximity to each other. We'll see that all of the serine proteases have, in fact, this catalytic triad. All the serine proteases have the same catalytic triad, they have the same basic geometry. Now, in the catalytic action of this enzyme, there's several things to consider. All right? Notice what's happening here. We have the enzyme in its starting state. Here's the OH of serine, here's histidine, here's aspartic acid. Over here, this histidine has pulled the proton off of this serine and created a nucleophile. This guy over here, this O that has lost its proton, still has electrons. It's negatively charged. It is a nucleophile. It seeks a nucleus. Okay? This is extraordinarily reactive, and it's called the alkoxide ion. Well, how did we get from here over to here? What's the difference? The answer is the binding of the substrate. The binding of the substrate. When the proper substrate binds in the enzyme, what's going to happen to the shape of the enzyme? It's going to change very, very slightly, right? These slight changes make big differences because that slight change in position now repositions these guys so that this guy, the, the, the uh, aspartic acid gets closer over here. This pushes electrons over to this half of the ring, as it were. This is slightly more negative, which, pull, which is the mechanism for pulling this proton off. So this slight rearrangement has changed the geometry of these very slightly so, is the, so the, the, this proton on the hydroxyl can get pulled. Everybody with me? Okay. So the reason that that happens, and I get asked this question all the time, why does it happen? It, get hap get, it happens because the proper substrate has bound in the active site. 
Once that happens, that slight change happens, and bang. Yes, Connie? What was the nucleophile? Uh, the nucleophile is called the alkoxide ion. OK, so let's now look at the overall mechanism. And I'm, I'm going to step you through it. Yeah. Bear with me. I'm going to go through it, and then I'm going to come back, and I'm going to go through it again. OK? So let me go through it and tell you where we are with stuff. OK? In this case, the proper substrate has bound into the um, uh, active site. This change has started to happen, and we see that this guy here is going to grab this um, proton and make the alkoxide ion. We see we're looking right in the middle of that process as we look right here. All right? Now, the proton here has been removed. And they haven't even shown you the intermediate of the alkoxide ion, which I think is unfortunate. But there's the alkoxide ion, I told you, is a nucleophile. That nucleophile seeks a nucleus, and the nucleus it seeks is the carbon of the carbonyl group. It literally attacks that carbon. That creates, oops, that creates this unstable intermediate right here. Okay. It actually has a tetrahedral structure, which isn't really important for our purposes. But this unstable intermediate falls apart in the next step. It falls apart. Well, do I want to have an unstable intermediate in my enzyme? Well, I may, not want, to have, I may want to be careful about that, because if I'm not careful, that unstable intermediate may react with my enzyme. So, the enzyme protects itself with something called an oxyanion hole. It's basically a stabilizing structure that keeps the intermediate from reacting with itself and allows the intermediate to fall apart on its own. So the oxyanion hole is doing that. So one of the questions I get is, well, where's all this happening? This is happening in the active site. The active site is a chamber of the enzyme. Active site. Oxyanion hole is a little room off of the active site. It's right there at the active site. All right, at this point, we have very quickly broken this bond. So we've just broken the peptide bond. You see what's left right now, which is one half of that peptide is linked covalently to that hydroxyl. The other one is only hydrogen bonded and leaves. The hydrogen bonding is not strong enough to hold it, so one half of it is gone. The other half is stuck to the enzyme. And the question about why is this the slow step, it's the slow step because we've got to go back and we've got to regenerate another nucleophile, and we've got to wait for water to get in there. Okay? And that's what's happening here. Okay. So now we've got to get this guy released. Water has to diffuse into the active site. And when it comes in, here's our nitrogen that likes pulling protons. Guess what it does? Grabs a proton off of water, makes a reactive hydroxide, which is also a nucleophile, attacks this guy, and look what happens. Breaks the bond. We go back to our starting material. This step takes a while because we have to get the water in there and everything positioned appropriately. Now, those are the general steps that are happening in that process. I'm going to go through them again. But before I do that, I'll take questions. Yes, sir? The oxyanion hole, is it uh, just a portion, like a clamshell top that comes down that's delta positive to stabilize the negative charge on the carbon oxygen? It's, it, is, it, it is there, yeah, basically to, to stabilize it. That's, that's correct. You're right. And I'll, sh I'll show you a, an example oxyanion hole in just a little bit. OK. OK, so let me step through it one more time. What do I need to know about this? All right? All right. I'm not going to ask you to draw this whole structure. OK? There's a relief. There's a big sigh of relief that goes through the room. Put this on the exam for Monday, right? Extra credit. Draw the. No, no, I'm not. I would get killed if I did that. <laughs> All right, so let's think about this. There's several key steps that I think are important. All right, first of all, we have the catalytic triad. The catalytic triad consists of aspartic acid, histidine, and serine. 
They work together to create a nucleophile. The way they do that is by the proper binding of the substrate causes the histidine ultimately to pull the proton off of the serine. That creates this O minus. The O minus is very reactive. It attacks the carbonyl carbon. We can think of that as sort of step one or one and a half. That attack on the carbonyl carbon creates an unstable intermediate that is stabilized by the oxyanion hole. Because it is not now going to react with the enzyme, the instability it takes out on itself and it cuts its own leg off. Right? The leg goes flying away and we're left with the other half stuck there. We can think of that as step two or two and a half. What's that? The intermediate is stabilized in the hole. That's correct. All right. Now we're, so we've just finished the fast step of the process. Now we're in the slow step. The slow step, we've got to get water in here, we've got to get it oriented, and we've got to get it activated. That happens here, as you can see. Water comes in. Here's our, our proton puller. There's the nucleophile we create. And again, the carbonyl carbon, you think you get picked on. Think about the carbonyl carbon. It's getting picked on twice here, right? Right. Getting picked on here, that creates an unstable intermediate that in this case falls off of the enzyme. When it falls off, it's released, and we're back where we started. Now, mechanisms are things that you can spend thousands of words on, but the reality is if you sit down and analyze what's going on with them, you'll, they, they will hopefully make much more sense than words can tell you. So look at the major features that I've talked about here. The catalytic triad, all right, the binding, the alkoxide ion creation. What did the oxy what did the oxyanion hole do? What was the fast step? What was the slow step? What role does water play in that process? And basically, you've got the mechanism. That's basically what happens here. Yes, sir. Okay. At the same point, it looks like with the dependence on electrophilic and nucleophilic attack for the different steps, this could really be screwed up by pH going plus or minus in either direction. So what is an approximate given range? That's a, a very good question. Uh, for chymotrypsin, its range, as I recall, is fairly physiological. And I don't know how wide that range is, but that's a very good question. Uh, different ser There are serine proteases, for example, trypsin. Uh, that can work uh, in a fairly acidic environment, in chymotrypsin and not so acidic environment. So there are ranges that, they, that, that this mechanism will work in. But I can't tell you the full range. I don't know that. OK. So I want you to sit down, look at that, write things out. I find it's really helpful to write things out. These are all just individual steps up close and personal. So I'm not going to go through each one of those. I think that's a bit of overkill. Here's the oxyanion hole that's there. And you can see this is sort of a representative structure. There's some stabilization of this negative uh, ion right here by these protons. Uh, but it's not an overly uh, charged structure, no. OK. Uh, now, there's something else that's important for us to understand about this enzyme. And it's kind of cool, and it's not difficult to understand. I said that. The, these changes happen when the proper substrate binds to the enzyme. How does the enzyme excuse me, know the proper substrate? Well, you've had this idea in your head, and it's correct, that the enzymes have a specific shape, and they will only accommodate certain shapes properly into there. All right? In the case of this enzyme, it has something called the S1 pocket. And like the Oxyanion hole, the S1 pocket is right there at the active site. The S1 pocket is the one place that different serine proteases differ from each other. They have different shapes and will bind different molecules as a result. All right? Now, you're looking at one of those pockets right here, and this pocket is kind of nice and deep. And what you see is the side chain of a phenylalanine, I think, that's in here. Okay? 
This will accommodate phenylalanine very nicely. Okay. It may not accommodate, accommodate something in here that's very charged. This is a relatively nonpolar environment. Okay. That is, there's no plus or minus charge in there. You saw some serines, but no plus or minus charges in there. Trypsin has a very different S1 pocket, as I will show you in a bit. But it uses the same catalytic mechanism. It's a serine protease, just like chymotrypsin is. But instead of cutting next to hydrophobic amino acids, trypsin will cut next to lysine and arginine, as I hope you got from my lecture before. And how is that difference accomplished? Well, when we look at that S1 pocket that, that trypsin has, and we compare it to the S1 pocket that chymotrypsin has, trypsin has a carboxyl group at the base of it. The negative charge attracts the positive charge. They make a nice little bond, and that's what determines that it's got the right thing bound. Now, I show you this structure to show you the important structural similarities of these two enzymes. They don't, I mean, that might look like there's some difference, there's a difference out here, there's a little bit of a difference there, but overall, those two structures are not very different from each other. That's not totally surprising because they're going to have similar actions, of similar mechanisms of action. Structure makes function. So if they have similar mechanisms, it's not surprising they would have very similar structures. The place where we would expect that they would differ would be in the S1 pocket, and that's indeed exactly what would happen. And somebody's going to ask me, where's the S1 pocket on here? And I don't know off the top of my head. I think it's down here, but I'm not sure of that. That's right. Chymotrypsin and trypsin overlapped. Okay. Now, this shows the S1 pockets. Chymotrypsin, trypsin, elastase, showing them very schematically. Okay? Very schematically. Chymotrypsin, fairly nonpolar. No pluses or minuses down here. Okay? So it accommodates phenylalanine nicely, it'll accommodate methionine nicely, it doesn't like pluses and minuses down there. Here's trypsin, it's got a carboxyl group at the bottom, it really likes if it's got a positively charged side chain like lysine or arginine has. Okay? Elastase is sort of like um, uh, chymotrypsin, except it's got some things jutting into it that keep big side chains from fitting in. So this guy here can't take a phenylalanine. It won't cut next to a phenylalanine because these things are blocking the access of the ring. This guy likes to cut next to alanines, a very tiny hydrophobic group that fits in there. So the S1 pockets really help us to uh, understand how the specificity of an enzyme is set up. Questions about this? Okay, all right, so that's cool. Okay. Um, put it back up there? Yeah, sure. All right, I'm going to tell you one more thing of medical implication, then I've got a song that I, that I think you'll enjoy. Okay? Actually, no, I don't have that. Maybe we'll just do the song. What is it? We'll finish early one day. How about that? Okay, so I have a song. This song I have never sung to a class before. So it's a brand new song about serine proteases. And I hope that you will sing loud because I will tell you what. I'll make a deal. If I hear you sing loudly today, we will have a second, a second, not just one, but a second extra credit on the exam. Are we set? Okay, let's go then. It's to the tune of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. All serine proteases work almost identically using amino acid triads catalytically. First they bind peptide substrates holding on to them so tight changing their structure when they Get them in the S1 site. Then there are electron shifts 
at the active site. Serine gives up its proton as the reaction goes on. Next, the alkoxide ion, being so electron rich, grabs peptides, carbonyl group, breaks its bond without a hitch. So one piece is bound to it, the other gets set free. Water has to act next to, let the final fragment loose. Then it's back where it started, waiting for a peptide chain. Then it can bind itself to, go and start all over again. Okay, have fun. Yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, my name is Kimberly. Hi, Kimberly. Um, my roommate Tiffany Harper and I. Oh, okay. Come yeah, hi. And say hi. Yeah, cool. I've heard great things about you. So. Uh oh, <laughs> they're not true. <laughs> nice to meet you. You like that one? Okay. Yeah. That's a brand new one. It's good. I really enjoyed it.